Hi everyone, this is Rob Packard from Medical Device Academy, and today's webinar is the six steps to ISO 1345 2016 certification. And we're also gonna be talking a little bit about MDSAP, uh, the Medical Device Single Audit Program, as we go through this. Uh, today's June 16th, 2020. The last time I recorded, I think it was, it was 2013 or 14, so it's been quite a while. Um, I first started doing ISO certification back in 2000, uh, four, I believe, was my first ISO certification for um, a quality system. It was at a small company called Z Medica. Um, I hadn't been trained as a quality and regulatory person, sort of learn by, learn by doing. Uh, they said, uh, you know, we need to help with regulatory affairs. We need help with quality. We need help with shipping. We need help with operations. We need help with uh, design of the device. And I was like, I don't know anything about quality or regulatory. Oh, you're a smart guy, you'll figure it out. And it is true, you can figure it out, but um, that is, that's not the best way to learn how to do this stuff. So I actually uh, was able to convince them to hire a consultant to help me. And that's how I survived through the process. And um, we are creating these videos for people. So people that are going through the their first ISO certification, um, know how to do that and know what the steps are and can avoid some of the mistakes that I had in the early years. Uh, in 2009, I actually uh, joined BSI and I was an ISO certification auditor. So I've actually trained hundreds of people on how to audit quality systems and do certification audits. So uh, I went from knowing nothing to uh, being one of the experts out there. But um, I still get people asking, well, uh, do you also help with ISO 1345? And I'm like, Look at my email. It's rob at 1345cert.com. That is uh, one of the key things that our business does. But uh, Medical Device Academy is a, a full service consulting firm that does quality and regulatory. And um, I still think I got one person here that's muted or not muted. So I'll try one more time. Okay. So, first slide here the agenda. So I broke down the uh, quality system certification into six steps, but really it can be a lot more than that. Um, many of the steps are iterative. So when I get to the section at the very beginning here on nine tasks required for each procedure, you're gonna repeat that sequence multiple times if you're writing your own procedures. Um, so that's a section that you might wanna look at very closely uh, if you're at that stage where you're writing your own procedures for a quality system. We're also going to talk a little bit about design planning, but we have a whole entire webinar that we teach that's over an hour in length just on design controls. And we also have a webinar on internal auditing, one on CAPAs, one on manager reviews, and one on ISO 1345. So each one of these is a webinar all by itself, and this is intended to be more of an overview that gives you um, a concept of the entire project and the scope of work that needs to be done, and is intended to help you plan your quality system implementation. So that's the focus of this webinar and because it's just the planning activity. I made it for free, but the other ones, um, except for management review are paid. So the management review one is also a, a free webinar that we offer. Okay, so for quality system planning, there's actually a requirement in the ISO 1345 standard for quality system planning and it's clause 5.4.2. Originally, ISO 1345 was based on the general quality system standard, which is ISO 9001, and that dates all the way back to 1994. And then in 2000, they made a revision. In 2008, they made a revision. In 2015, they made a massive revision. They rewrote it, renumbered it, and it no longer really resembles 1345. But up until 2015, the two standards looked very, very similar. And there were some additional quality system requirements that were specific to medical devices, but in general, the clauses followed each other. And there were really just two differences between ISO 9001 and 1345. Number one was that instead of customer satisfaction being a focus in ISO 9001, in 1345, they use, um, is your quality system um, is your quality system effective? And are you looking, um, 
they're, they're looking for you asking for post-market follow-up or post-market surveillance from customers looking for the risks associated with your device. So it's, it's a little different focus than customer satisfaction. You're not asking for customer satisfaction surveys in ISO 1345. You're looking for, did the, were there any complaints? Were there adverse events? Were there deaths? Um, were there use errors? Problems with the product uh, that would require you to redesign or implement Kappas. Another thing is that we have continuous improvement as a concept in ISO 9001. And in 1345, we want to maintain the effectiveness of the quality system rather than continuously changing it. Once it's effective, we want to maintain that effectiveness rather than requiring continuous improvement. So that is a difference. Those two differences are unique to 9001 and different from 1345. But they, in 2015, they rewrote the whole 9001 standard and things deviate a lot now. Now they don't even have a preventive action clause in 9001 and they've, they've made a lot of changes uh, in the structure of the, the guidance. So um, we're not gonna talk more about 9001, but for those of you that are wondering, those are the, the key differences. When you create a quality plan for your implementation of your quality system, you need to think about what are the elements of that plan? What are the required document in, documents in your quality system that you need to have? And you should include those in the plan. So number one, you're going to need a quality policy. A lot of companies will have that uh, signed and posted in the lobby of their offices, as well as in, in their quality manual. And they may have it as a separate document. So it may be in multiple places. Some people even put it on their swipe cards that they, they get into the building. So on the back of the card, it'll have the quality policy. All of those are acceptable ways to do it, but the idea is that everybody in your company should be aware of the quality policy. They don't necessarily have to have it memorized and be able to recite it, but they should understand it and, and have some way that their job relates to that quality policy. So you might even get asked by an auditor, how is the quality policy relevant to you? So that should be a question you think about when you're preparing people for their certification audits. Another thing that everybody should have is quality objectives. Every department should have quality objectives. Every process should think about what, what objectives are important for this process. And you need to identify those official corporate quality objectives and be tracking those. The progress on those should be public. Uh, you should be communicating the progress on those quality objectives to your company. It shouldn't be a secret. Um, it's not something to be discussed only behind closed doors. You, if you want the whole company to move towards those objectives, you need to share that. Um, and you also need to have other types of metrics as well. So not everything is a quality objectives. You might have um, monitoring and measuring of every process, but only certain ones are worthy of a quality objective. The next thing you need is a quality manual. Um, the FDA QSR does not require a quality manual. They require a quality system. They require a quality uh, policy. They require quality objectives, but they don't require that you have a quality manual. Uh, but most companies do. And the FDA has been talking about actually implementing ISO 1345 as a requirement and modernizing the requirements. That hasn't happened. It's been promised many times. Uh, so we're not sure when that will happen. But that is a, there's nothing that, uh, prevents you from doing ISO 1345, and it's very, very similar to the QSR. In fact, the same people that develop one develop the other. Uh, the third requirement here is procedures and records. So you need there, if you actually go through the uh, ISO 1345 standard, there are approximately 28 procedures that are required. And then of course, there are records associated with many of those uh, or all of those processes. So uh, if you do a search for the word procedure or procedures, you will find all the places where it, it requires a documented procedure. And then it, wherever you see a reference to clause 4.2.5, that's going to be where there's a record requirement. Um, the next requirement is documents and records needed for planning and operation and control of processes. So um, in addition to having required documented procedures, you can also have other things that are documented, such as work instructions, um, inspection procedures. Um, you're gonna have all kinds of records for monitoring of different processes. So those are gonna be required. And then there are specific documents that are required by regulations, such as the FDA requires a recall procedure, requires an MDR procedure for adverse event reporting, 
they require um, Oh, what's another thing? They require UDI requirements, um, and you have to maintain a GUDID uh, database on the FDA website. Um, so there are a lot of different things that are, are regulatory requirements. In Europe, we have technical files, vigilance reporting. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Post-market surveillance uh, documentation, clinical evaluation reports. So every country has its own unique regulatory requirements, and those need to be considered in your quality system as well. And you determine it based first on what countries you're going to market in. And so it may change as you add new countries. Another thing that needs to be included is what quality system standards apply. So not only does ISO 1345 apply to your quality system, there are also some other uh, standards that are referenced in ISO 1345. Among them is the ISO 14971 uh, standard for risk management. That's in clause 7.1. There's uh, IEC 62366. That's a usability standard. I believe that's in clause 7.3. You have a software requirement also in 7.3. That's uh, for software development and documentation. That's IEC 62304. So we, we also have a, a standard for clinical trials and clinical investigations that I believe, let's see, I'm stretching here. Um, nope, I'm not going to remember it. <laughs> so some of these are off the top of my head, but it, I believe that's also in the section on uh, design validation because uh, clinical studies or clinical investigations would be a design validation activity. There are applicable regulatory requirements. So I had mentioned the QSR, that's 21 CFR 820. This 803 for regulatory reporting of adverse events. This 806 for recalls. Um, this 830 for the UDI requirements. Those are all US requirements. Then we have Canada, we have SOR 98282. In Europe, we have the MDR and the IVDR. Those are the new uh, regulations in Europe that are coming along. So we have regulatory requirements in every single country. Yeah, so you have to decide what countries you're going to be in and then figure out what the requirements are for the quality systems in those countries. And then we have product requirements. In Europe, they're going to be implementing some new common specifications for product categories. We already have different ISO standards for products, such as uh, dental hand pieces, an example, dental implants, orthopedic implants. We have... Uh, biocompatibility requirements for any uh, patient contacting products. We have special standards for uh, air pathway devices, such as ventilators uh, that are specific to biocompatibility. We have electrical safety standards, sterilization standards, so tons of different product uh, requirements that may or may not be applicable to your type of product. So that's one of the things you have to systematically do in your design process is to figure out what the product requirements are, and those are also called design inputs. So all these are design or all these are quality system planning requirements that should be considered in your clause 5.4.2, the, the quality plan. And so you need to systematically go through each of these things that need to be considered and come up with what documents need to be created and who's going to create them in your company. And it should not be all part of one person's job because it's just too much for one person. It really gets spread across the entire organization. For those of you that are not familiar with this term, MDSAP is the Medical Device Single Audit Program. Uh, they were doing a pilot. The pilot is completely gone now. Uh, now it's uh, an actual regulation that is accepted and fully implemented. Canada is the only country that's made it mandatory to have an MDSAP certificate. Canada used to have what they called the um, uh, CAMDCAS system. So it was... Um, Canadian, Canadian Medical Device Conformity Assessment System. Uh, they no longer have that. They replaced it with MDSAP. And the countries that recognize MDSAP are Australia, Canada, Brazil, USA, and Japan. So um, in the US, if you have an MDSAP certificate and you provide it voluntarily to the FDA, it exempts you from uh, routine inspections. It doesn't mean they won't come and visit you if you have recalls or adverse events, but the routine inspections you shouldn't be getting if you submit your reports each year. Um, Brazil, it'll get you, uh, get you into uh, Brazilian approval from Anvisa 
without going through an on-site inspection from Brazil's and visa uh, auditors. Uh, Canada, it's the only way you can get into Canada. And uh, for Australia and Japan, it also is recognized in those countries and helps streamline the approval process. So in all of these countries, it is, uh, it is something that you should be getting to try to help your company get to approval or it's required for approval. Interestingly enough, Europe is not on this list. Europe has its own new regulations that it created, but the same organizations that are doing the European auditing for CE marking are also conducting the MDSAP. So you wanna be kind of careful when you select a certification body that you're picking one that can do MDSAP in case you want to go to one of these five countries, but you also wanna think of which ones can do uh, CE marking. So the list I've come up with, and I actually have it on our website, I should have probably provided a hyperlink, but there, there are 12 different companies that uh, can support MDSAP and CE marking under the new regulations. And not all of those are approved yet, um, but uh, all of them are uh, in the process of getting approved and should be approved by the end of the year. Um, oh, one other thing on MDSAP, this, this is an ISO 1345 certificate. When, so when you get an MDSAP certificate, it is also an ISO 1345 certificate, um, but it's a special type. They use a special certification process with a special regulatory checklist for each of the countries on this list. Um, so it is a 1345 certificate, but it's a special one and it's a little more expensive and it takes a little longer to get. But um, if you do, MD SAP, you're also getting 1345 at the exact same time. Okay, this next slide, we're talking about the requirements for creating SOPs or standard operating procedures. Uh, these are the 28 required records or I'm sorry, documents in ISO 1345. And the first thing you should do, and I actually recorded a webinar about this, so the YouTube link is at the bottom. Uh, if you're interested in watching this, I'll go in more detail on that uh, webinar, but it's a short one. And I'm gonna cover each of those slides in this presentation. So uh, we'll go through it once and fairly quickly. The first step is prioritize and schedule your audits. The second one is buying the standard. Then which clauses are applicable, assign a process owner or a subject matter expert, create the form, then the flow chart, then the SOP, do a gap analysis of that procedure against the requirements, train your employees, approve the SOP, and then start using it. And then you repeat the process for the next procedure and you keep on doing that. You can approve multiple in parallel or you can do them sequentially. It all depends on how quickly you're gonna be implementing your quality system. But usually the first three procedures we develop are the document control procedure, the record control procedure, and the training procedure. And you can see document control would be approval of all your standard operating procedures. The record control would be control of all the records created from those, which are filled in forms and, and uh, other types of uh, records. And then the last one is the training, which you need for every single process. You need to train people on that and document the training requirements. So those are usually your first three procedures that you will approve in your quality system um, because they apply to every procedure, not just uh, they aren't just applicable to those three, they're applicable to every single procedure. You need document control of the procedures, record control of the records from those procedures, and training records for each procedure. So first step, prioritize and schedule. When you go through this, uh, like I said, those are usually your first three, but when will the other procedures get done? If you're doing design controls in your company, you're probably going to need design control procedures at the early part of the process. If you're um, for the complaint handling, vigilance and recalls, you don't need those until you actually have a product on the market. So those can be at the end of the process. And then the other procedures are gonna be somewhere in the middle. So it all has a, has a prioritization based on when you need it. But document control, record control, training should be the, probably the first three and design controls, uh, risk management, software and usability might be the next four that you implement and those seven are usually the, the first batch of procedures that we give to companies that are implementing a quality system and using our turnkey quality system. And if you're implementing this sort of a plan, you wanna identify the dates for each of the procedures so you can see on your timeline, here's when each of the procedures should be approved, here's when training needs to be completed, and this is when the entire quality system will be 
implemented so we know when we can do the ISO certification audits. For every single procedure and particularly the um, product specific ones and process specific ones, you may have standards that apply. And so the two places that I go to buy standards are AMI.org, that's the US National uh, Standards Organization for Medical Devices, and then EVS.E is the Estonian Standards Organization. I use them for most of the European standards, and sometimes some of the older standards are available from there less expensively than I can get from other places. So those are the two places I look, and I provided the hyperlinks. Um, which clauses are applicable? So some of your clauses in the standard are not going to be applicable based on your device. A lot of times service and installation are not applicable to a lot of products, particularly disposable sterile products might not have those. So you need to figure out which clauses are applicable, not only in the quality system standards, but also in the product specific standards. Next, you need to assign process owners. The, we often refer to this as the subject matter expert or SME. We're not going to um, try to do all the procedures ourselves. So one person could, I mean, yes, you could implement all the procedures that can be done, but it would take very, very long time. And it's hard for somebody to be an expert in everything. Usually you'll want to compartmentalize that and have spread the, the uh, responsibility for learning different procedures and standards. Uh, to try to stay up to date on all the standards that will be applicable to a medical device is, is nearly impossible. And so you, you really need to have it be a team effort. And you may even have to bring in some outside consultants. Um, if I often tell people, you know, if, if this is something I can't answer as a regulatory consultant that sees hundreds of different standards and works on hundreds of different submissions, then you probably need a consultant that, that is their expertise in that one standard. Uh, for instance, electrical safety, we usually bring in Leo Eisner to help with uh, electrical safety issues because he's actually a convener of the standards, reviews it, and actually trains the FDA on that standard. The next step, step five, is to create the actual writing of the procedure. And um, one of the steps that I recommend is to start with the record. F create a form that you're going to fill in in the order of the requirements of the regulation or the standard. So each line item that's required for a complaint record, put those in your form in the order that they're required. That's how we recommend doing it. And you might even number it. And if you number it, you can cross-reference those numbers into your flow chart that you might create as well and into your procedure. Uh, section seven of a lot of uh, our procedures is the section that actually has the step-by-step -step instructions. And it's nice if you have numbers in your flow chart and numbers in your form to match up with the outline of your procedure. So you might have 7.1 is the first step, 7.2 is the seven, second step, 7.3 and so on. So those are the three documents you're gonna be, or three, yeah, documents you'll be creating is a, a form to fill in, maybe more than one, maybe a log, a process flow diagram, and the flow diagram often we incorporate into the procedures, and then the procedure or work instruction itself. Once you've created a draft SOP, then you should verify that it meets 100% of the requirements. Some people do this during an audit, but audits are only supposed to be a sampling. So to spend an entire internal audit reviewing every single line item of a procedure is tedious and not the best use of your auditor's time. The better way to do it is a gap analysis. And if you're wondering how to do a gap analysis, um, essentially we create a table where in the left-hand column we have the requirement, in the right-hand side we show where the requirement is found in that procedure or we indicate that it's missing and, and identify it with that with maybe some color coding. But Matthew Walker provided a, an article on how to do that, and I think he's even recorded a short webinar on it. So we have a hyperlink there on our website on where you can find that article for how to do a gap analysis. The next thing is training. Once you've created a draft of the procedure and you've verified it meets all the requirements, now you need to train people. And so this is a screen capture of our what our new website will probably look like. We're going to, we're in the middle of an upgrading of our website, but we have hundreds of webinars. And so we're trying to upgrade the usability of our website for 
accessing webinars and standard operating procedures and blogs. So this is a sort of a mock-up of what the webinars page will look like, but we have upcoming webinars and on-demand webinars. We have a YouTube channel, but for your company, you should have um, not only the initial training that you do for your employees, but whenever you have a new employee coming in, you want them to get the same training. So we recommend you record the training, which is why webinars are nice. So you can outsource that or purchase webinars uh, from our company or other companies, but you could also create your own. And that's one of the reasons why we give companies the native slide decks of our trainings. So if you wanted to, you can add in references to your own procedures. Um, you might use different numbers than we use. You could also include your logo instead of ours and you can make it your own training and record a webinar using Zoom or GoToMeeting or um, Microsoft Teams or some other platform where you record this session. But to walk people through that, you can do a remote training and you can record it and share that with all your employees and all new employees coming in afterwards. Here's a little bit of training advice. Uh, we do a lot of training, that's why our company's name is Medical Device Academy. We do a lot of training. But when, you, when you're training people, one of the things to do is to spread out the training for your quality system. Just like you don't wanna write all your procedures in one day, um, you don't wanna do all the training in one day. That would be exhausting, so spread it out. One a week is a good pace. You, if you need to go faster, you can go faster, but having it on the calendar with a regular meeting time, that way everybody knows that time is blocked off and you can have people show up and maybe do a lunch, um, brown bag lunch or, or order pizza or whatever, and you have people watch that uh, training. The next thing is record your trainings for reuse. So um, even if you're doing an in-house training on something, so maybe it's HIPAA compliance or something like that, record that training. Don't, don't just create it and then archive it. Um, record it and make it part of everybody's training when they come on board in the company that has that role and responsibility. You also wanna verify training effectiveness. One of the best ways to do that is a quiz. And you might wanna repeat the training that is required for the stage one processes because those are gonna be, the stage one processes are the most important core management uh, processes that are gonna get looked at during every audit. Those are manager review and CAPA uh, and internal auditing. Those are gonna get covered almost every single audit that you have. They're gonna be looking, did the company conduct an, an internal audit this year? Did they conduct a manager review this year? Did they, have they been maintaining their CAPA process? They will be looking at those in every single audit you have because of those, some of the most important processes in your quality system and necessary to keep it maintained. You also wanna make sure that every process owner is responsible for training, presentations, quizzes, and scheduling. So when you do this training, it doesn't need to be the same person every week after week. It doesn't need to be HR, it doesn't need to be quality. It should be whoever the, your subject matter expert is, that should be the person doing that training. Sub eight, you should be approving your new SOP. Um, this could be a stamp, this could be a signature, this could be an electronic documentation approval, whatever your system is for approving the procedures. Um, it could be a separate form that approves it. We call those uh, document change notices. Whatever your system is, you need to approve these procedures and you would indicate what the effective date is. Depending on what your preference is, you could do this step before training or after training. Some companies like to do the training beforehand and the procedure becomes effective the date it's approved. Other companies approve a procedure and then make the effective date in 30 days, giving people 30 days to train on the procedure. Or if it's something that's more urgent as part of a corrective action, they might give less time. But those are two different strategies. Neither one is wrong, but you need to identify in your training and in your document control procedure which system you're gonna use. Are you gonna train first and then approve it or approve it and then make it effective after the training? You decide. And step nine, you actually have to use these procedures. You will not get ISO certified if you approve a bunch of procedures but don't actually generate any records. You don't have to go quite as far as this person has done. Um, it wasn't just one person, it was actually a VA um, hospital, I believe, or uh, maybe VA offices, but it was a, they had just a little bit out of control record handling here. So hopefully your system is a little more organized and a little less uh, paper intensive. Maybe it's an electronic system and it's validated, but 
This should help as a visual reminder, you need records. Once you've created one procedure, you go back and you repeat the whole process again for the next procedure. What is the standard? And I'll, I'll go back real quick. So prioritize and schedule. What's the next one of my priorities? By the standard, what clauses are applicable? Assign a process owner, write the form, then the flow chart, then the SOP, perform a gap analysis, train people, put it on a training schedule, record it, give a quiz, approve your SOP, and then the, use it, generate the records. Okay, now we're gonna get into more of the processes, that some of the processes that you need to have implemented and generate some records before your ISO certification audit. So if you're going to have design controls in the scope of your procedure, and that is the only one that you can actually exclude from 1345, there are other clauses you can say are not applicable because of the nature of your product, like sterilization might not be applicable if you have non-sterile products. Um, in, uh, installation might not be applicable if the nature of your product doesn't require installation or service. But design, you can exclude or include. So you could outsource it to some other organization and say it's not applicable to our firm. We've excluded it. That's your choice. But if you're including it, you have to show records. That doesn't mean the entire design process has to be completed but you do need to make sure that you have um, records of design controls and design planning. So I've indicated some of our procedures here that would be part of the design process. Uh, you have the design control procedure, the risk management procedure, the software development procedure, if you have software, and usability. We also have a combined design risk management plan template. That template uh, includes records from all four of those processes already in it and it's broken up by phase. So you'll find that to be a very useful planning document when you're trying to figure out, well, when is summative testing done? When is formative testing done? When do I create a software architecture diagram? When do I create the SRS? All those things are in that template. So it'll really help you. And it comes with either our design control procedure or risk management. So whichever one you get, it's in there. Now I'm gonna walk you a little bit through this design planning so you can see the overall concept and I'm gonna do it in layers because it's very complex when you add all four of those processes together. So this is a typical phase gate process combi combined with a um, two hump diagram. The two humps are research and development. Research happens first and then development and there's usually an overlap. Ideally, when you start the development, that's when you should be saying, okay, we're gonna start documenting a design history file. But a lot of people don't start the design history file until after they've already started verification testing, uh, way over here around uh, this phase and the pilot phase. So they have to document a lot of this activity retroactively. And that's not ideal, but that is what happens to a lot of companies the first time through. So if that happens, don't panic, it's not a problem. You just document some of the work you've already done retroactively. Um, each of these phases here that I've identified by arrows typically has a gate in between. It can be a hard gate, so you may not go onto this phase until you finish this phase, or it could be a soft gate. You could say, there are a couple of things that are not quite done, but we're gonna go on to the next phase and finish them up in parallel with this next phase. Either one's acceptable, but a lot of companies prefer to have hard gates, sorry, they wanna have hard gates. And the reason for that is because they don't want a project to progress to the next stage unless they've met all the requirements. And that's a lot for budgeting reasons. The next step here is to add risk management. So you have all these des different design phases. When do the risk management activities happen? They don't all happen at the end. A lot of companies will start documenting risk at the end of the process but it's intended to be implemented throughout the entire product development life cycle. So you come up with a risk management plan the same time you come up with a design plan. You do hazard identification as an input into your design inputs. So the hazards determine which standards are applicable and what testing should be done as a design input. Your risk estimation and risk evaluation and risk control option analysis help you finalize which design solution is the safest of your solutions or the most effective or both. The verification and validation testing, that's done here. Risk control 
effectiveness verification is the same as design verification. And the risk benefit analysis is relying on um, clinical data. And that could be literature or it could actually be a clinical, in, a clinical study. And then we have an overall risk evaluation um, where we determine whether the risks are acceptable and then uh, decide, okay, it's okay to release this product. And we have a final risk management review. Um, and if it requires a 510K, you're also gonna have to wait until you get the final 510K clearance. If you're submitting for CE marking, these documents are gonna be needed so you can submit for CE marking. So you have to get all through the risk management activities before you can submit CE marking. So CE usually happens after a 510K submission. Um, I've also indicated in here, here's a pre-sub. You would do that during the development phase after you've approved your inputs. And here's when you're doing your verification testing, but that's also when you'd be writing your 510K. And I have 100 days down here because it typically takes 100 days to do a lot of those tests, like biocompatibility or electrical safety and EMC testing. And then this 90 plus days is your 510K review. Now we're gonna add usability. So the first step is to identify usability activities that are gonna be needed uh, as part of your design and risk management. Um, and that says plant, it should say plan, sorry about that. Um, but there, there's a lot of activities that you'll have at the beginning that are usability. You're looking for uh, what use errors are there are, what use environment, what uses there are, interoperability with other devices. So those are all things to think about when you're considering usability activities. And those are all at the planning phase leading up to hazard identification and design inputs. Once we're in development, this is when you would do some formative testing. And there are three different types of formative tests you would do. One of them would be for evaluating different design features. So which design feature accomplishes this the best and, and addresses the usability or ergonomics issues best. The next one would be to help you identify the proper instruction for use. So you wanna identify all the critical tasks and help somebody step-by-step -step how to operate this device. That would be a second reason for doing um, some formative testing. And then the third reason would be to develop a training program for users. A lot of times we, we have complex devices that are very uh, easy to make mistakes in or use errors when people use it. So we want to develop a training program. We need to validate that training program. And that's one of the purposes of doing formative testing. And you might do those at different times in that development phase. The last bit of usability testing would be the summative testing. This is the final usability test that's done as part of your verification testing. It's simulated use testing. You typically want to have no failures in a summative test. Any failures should come earlier in the formative testing, but the summative test should be sort of a foregone conclusion. So companies that only do summative testing, they're really rolling the dice that they're gonna have a use error uh, because they really should have done the formative testing earlier to make sure that they're going to pass that summative test. And that summative testing should be done uh, during that pilot or verification phase just before you submit your 510K. Um, and it's also required as an, imp or at least some usability testing is required as an input into your electrical safety. Uh, that's one of the requirements of IEC 60601-1. Okay, now we've implemented design controls. We've got records, we've got design inputs, and we've maybe got the beginnings of design outputs. We may not be finished, but we have enough records and a company can do a certification audit and say, yes, you have a design process. But before you can actually go and do those certification audits, you're required to have one full quality system audit done internally. So you need to audit your company once for the whole quality system before your certification audits. And the people that are responsible for processes can't audit themselves. So if you only have a company of two or three people, you're probably gonna have to bring in an outside consultant. It's very difficult for somebody to, to, um, to try to conduct a full quality system audit when you only have two or three people. Uh, but if you, if you need to do an internal audit, one of the things you need is a procedure for internal auditing. You need a schedule for internal audits. Even if it's only one per year, you still need to schedule and it has to be documented. You need an agenda prior to the audit. 
you need to take audit notes. There should be objective evidence that you conducted the audit and what objective evidence you collected during the audit. And then finally, you should have an audit report and we actually provide a template. So the things in blue, the procedure, the schedule and the template for the report, those are all things we sell. Um, but if you're interested, we have a, a webinar coming up on June 23rd on the process approach to auditing. And then we have a remote auditing webinar that's on July 16th. I'll give you a brief introduction to the process approach to auditing, but there's a YouTube webinar that I've provided a link there for that walks you through the turtle diagram. And a lot of people, they, they think, well, process approach to auditing, it's just auditing a process. Nope, it's not. There is a, this, a very specific process that you're supposed to be using for the process approach to auditing. The intent of the process approach to auditing is to uh, identify the linkages between processes. What are the inputs from the previous process and the outputs to the next process? What are the um, support processes? What, what are um, management processes that you're gonna be interacting with? So any metrics from your process are gonna go into manager review. Um, from document control, those are gonna be your procedures that define your process. Um, you're gonna have maintenance, you're gonna have calibration. So uh, I'll define where these things are. You would have records that would come into your process as well as raw materials, would be inputs to your process. You would interview the process owner or SME and that person would describe the process briefly. You're gonna have outputs to the process. Those are typically gonna be records as well as raw materials or sub-assemblies coming out of the process. You're gonna have a peer, what equipment in facilities do you need? So work environment, calibration, process validation, software validation, and um, equipment maintenance. All those things should be covered under that section. With whom we're looking for training records and who performs this process. Down here, we're looking for uh, documents, forms, and records. Um, work instruction standards um, is covered down here. And then metrics, those are the um, monitoring and measuring the process as well as any quality objectives you identify. And this is a really great source of preventive actions as well. So by just remembering these seven steps and drawing this diagram, which we also call a turtle diagram, uh, this is the shell, the head, the tail, and the four legs. So that's why we call it a turtle diagram, but it comes from David Crosby, um, I'm sorry, Phil Crosby, uh, back in, um, what is the date? I think 1968. Um, so it's been around for quite a while and they use it in the automotive industry, the aerospace industry, but the process approach to auditing is much easier to learn because there's only seven things to remember. And it has a visual diagram that goes with it and you can apply it to anything. So I actually give you a few examples in that webinar. So check it out on YouTube. Once you have done an internal audit, you're going to have some nonconformities. If, you, if you've done a thorough review of, or for thorough internal audit for your first time, it would be shocking if you didn't have at least some nonconformities because it's a brand new quality system. So each of those findings, you need to implement corrective actions. So you need a procedure for corrective actions. You need a CAPA log to keep track of when they're open and when they're closed, which ones are, are still outstanding, when the effectiveness checks will be done and you need a form to document the objective evidence of the CAPA. And if you're interested, we're doing a webinar on how to create a risk-based CAPA process on June 30th. But they give you a couple more slides here about CAPAs. A lot of people uh, think that, well, we did an internal audit, so we have CAPAs. There are other sources of CAPAs too. You have complaints. So once you launch your product, you're going to have complaints and therefore you're gonna have CAPAs from that. When you produce products, whether it's incoming inspection, you have non-conforming material, in-process non-conforming, or final inspection non-conformity, you have lots of places where you have non-conforming material. All those are opportunities for implementing corrective actions. The voice of customer surveys, that would be more like customer satisfaction. That would be a source of corrective and preventive actions. Internal audits is a source of uh, corrective actions. Manager reviews would be a source of corrective actions and preventive actions. The MAUD database, which is the adverse event reporting database, that would be source of corrective actions or preventive if you're looking at competitors' products and what mistakes they had and trying to learn from their mistakes. Clinical studies could be a source of corrective actions. 
uh, validation of your device that can be a source of corrective or preventive actions. Uh, risk analysis could be a source of credit, corrective and preventive, and service could be a source of corrective or preventive actions. And then we're required to do effectiveness tests, checks of every single kappa. So when you implement a kappa, you make sure it's effective so it doesn't occur again. When I talk about risk-based kappas, not everything opens gets opened up as a kappa. Um, there was a, a Red Cross um, um, quality manager that was involved in the first kappa training course I ever took. And they were telling me that for every single time somebody didn't answer a page on time, they opened up a kappa. And that's not the way to do it. You end up with hundreds or thousands of kappas um, when you could have just opened up one for pages not being answered on time. And if you do that one kappa well and show it's effective, then you shouldn't have more people responding late. And um, if you have thousands of people responding to pages and only once in a while they're a little bit late, a few seconds later, a few minutes late, um, that might be something that you should do a trend analysis of and set a control limit and an action limit. So at this level, we'll investigate, see if there was a problem. At this level, we're actually going to take corrective action. So not everything should automatically be a knee-jerk reaction. We open up a kappa. Sometimes you need a kappa. Sometimes the problem is so big and affects so many different areas that you actually need a quality plan because you're going to have to revise multiple procedures and train people to potentially a new standard, like uh, a new version of uh, the risk management standard, ISO 14971. So that's when you might need a quality plan. And then to, as part of your CAPA process, you're gonna investigate the root cause. You're trying to identify the root cause so you can eliminate the cause at its source. And one of the tools, and this is just one root cause analysis tool, it's called the Fishbone Diagram. It's also called an Ishikawa Diagram or a Cause and Effect Diagram. And some people refer to these six elements as the six Ms because they all begin with M if you name this way, but some people will call them materials, environment instead of mother nature or measurement or calibration, manpower or people, um, machines or equipment, and then methods or um, work instructions. So there are different names for each of these, but if you name them this way, they all begin in M, if that helps you remember the six M's of a cause and effect diagram. And I, label this as a fish just to help you remember the fishbone concept. Um, the next thing we I wanted to cover related to CAPA, and I think this is the last slide on CAPAs, is the importance of doing quantitative effectiveness checks. Whenever you can, try to make sure your effectiveness checks are quantitative. There are way too many people that um, identify, oh, this was effective because I did what I said I was going to do. Just because you implemented the plan doesn't mean the plan worked. So uh, you're, you're making a lot of assumptions that about if we do this, this will be the effect. Prove it with numbers, be objective. Um, you can do internal audits and you can do a re-audit to verify it, but even auditing is somewhat subjective. Um, this particular example, it shows you a process specification. It doesn't really matter what the process is, but if you're measuring the process and the upper limit is 6.6 .6, and you're hovering just below that, if you calculate the process capability coefficient or CPK and you get a number less than one, that means you know more than 10% of the time here, you're going to have um, potentially product that is not uh, going to be within your specification. And we got lucky that none of them were over the specification, but we're hovering way too close to that limit. So you might make a change in your process variables and that adjusts the data down. And now you're, you have a much higher process capability after the change. And so in this case, because we didn't have any non-conforming product before we made the change, it's called the preventive action. If any of those uh, data points on the left had been above the specification line, then instead of a preventive action, it would be called a corrective action. So that's why I say um, monitoring and measuring and metrics are your best source of preventive actions. The next step after you have your, so you've implemented your all your procedures, 
you've got a quality plan, you implemented your procedures, then you did an internal audit, and then you implemented CAPAS, now you are ready for our management review. Until you've implemented CAPAS, you're not ready for your management review. So you have to do that internal audit and to have CAPAS before you can do this. Um, these are the different things on here, the different clauses that should be covered in your management review process. There's, you should verify that your quality system remains effective. Uh, that's covered in clause 5.1. You should have your quality policy reviewed and determine if any changes are needed to the quality policy. You should uh, review how you're doing on your quality objectives and determine if new ones are required or if additional uh, corrective actions are needed to uh, meet those objectives that you're not haven't met yet. You need to identify who's the management representative, make sure they have the authority to conduct the management reviews or manage the man metric uh, manage the management reviews and to issue the meeting minutes for the management review and uh, follow up on any uh, action items from the manager review. Um, the manager representative requirement is in clause 5.5.2. There are also 12 required inputs. The 2003 version of the standard only had eight, now it has 12, and there are four required outputs. There used to be only three. So those are some slight changes that you need to be aware of if you're familiar with the 2003 version of the standard. Also, um, we have, like I said, we're gonna do a re-recording of our manager review webinar. That'll be on July 7th, and that's a free webinar if you're interested, and it will be on YouTube as well. When you produce a manager review, one of the techniques that I like to use is I actually use a PowerPoint presentation template and every single requirement in the manager review inputs and outputs, as well as um, 5.3, 5.41, 5.51, and 5.52, all of those clauses on this slide are covered in my presentation slide deck for a manager review. And as you can see in this particular slide up here, applicable or new revised regulatory requirements is clause 5.6.2L. And so I actually filled this in. I did a review. I said, well, what new, what new requirements are there? Well, there's a new ISO standard for 14971, the risk management standard. There's one for the guidance document for risk management. There's a post-market surveillance standard that you should be aware of. That was brand new release has a lot of valuable information for those companies that are doing things in Europe. You have the new European regulations that was delayed by a year. And then we have Canadian changes. In, on December 16th, 2019, they updated um, the Canadian medical device regulations. And in a review of part one, here are the changes that I found. And I indicate what those changes are so you can tell whether they affect your system. And then, Below that, in the notes section of the PowerPoint, we added action items. So we, next to each one, we indicated what the changes were. And so um, you would put this action items to be included in the outputs, which would be the slide for 5.6.3C. So there'd be another slide, it would be blank, and you would add these things to it and review them at the end of the session. So you can actually PDF this um, notes page and you can have a whole bunch of PowerPoints that'll show the slide, that was the inputs to the process, and then the notes, that's your meeting minutes from the process. So you just PDF your meeting minute notes and you're done with your meeting minutes for your manager review. So that's how I create them, but you can do it your own way. A lot of people like to type up a report, but I find this is much, much faster. Now that you've completed your manager review, you've done all the things that you need to do to be prepared for your stage one audit. The stage one audit is a readiness audit. They're looking for, do you have all your procedures in place and have you implemented them so you're ready for stage two? And the things they look for for readiness are, do you have records of some of the key processes? Have you implemented a manager review? Have you implemented an internal audit? Have you implemented CAPAs? If you don't have any records, then they'll say you're not ready for stage two. If you are missing a procedure, they may say you're also not ready. Um, in fact, I believe it's in the MDSAT program, if you have three missing procedures, those are an absence of a quality system requirement, it gets escalated to a four. And if you have three fours, that's a five-day notification to regulators. And I believe that prevents you from uh, actually being moved on to stage two. So you would have to repeat your stage one in that case, which you have to pay for again, of course. So you wanna make sure that you have all the required procedures before you proceed to stage uh, one. 
And once they've determined you're ready, then then we'll schedule a stage two, which is typically four to six weeks after the stage one. Um, it could be sooner, but most companies need a little bit of time to implement some corrective actions between the two. And if you want to know more details about stage one and stage two audits, on July 17th, we're going to cover stage one. And on July 28th, we're going to cover stage two. So we're going to go in depth on what things are covered and what the requirements are of ISO 1345 clause by clause. That brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, now's the time when you can unmute your mics or you can type in the chat box uh, to ask any questions. So please let me know if you have any questions. Um, we got quite a few people online here. Um, and I'm also gonna take a quick look and see if I've gotten any emails from anybody uh, that are asking questions. No, I don't, I don't see any questions on my emails. Um, any questions for the chat? If we don't have any questions, I can, oh, we gotta ha have a question. Go ahead. Hey, hey Rob, hey, this is James. Hey, sorry, I, I came late. Um, um, no problem. Can, can I get the, the, the presentation? I mean, uh, Absolutely. What do you have here? This is, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I will email you the slide deck and anybody that registers for this webinar, uh, you actually filled in a form, you should get it automatically. You should have actually gotten it this morning, but I will send that to you, James. And um, also, as I said at the very beginning before you joined, um, this is also going to be recorded on YouTube. Um, so you'll be able to go onto YouTube and see the webinar. So if you do have proprietary questions or confidential questions, don't ask those now, otherwise I'll have to go back and edit it out. Um, if you want to schedule a meeting with me to discuss things uh, confidential in nature, please go to this Calendly link at the bottom of the page and schedule a meeting with me. Um, right. Somebody said they, they sent in a question when they signed up and did I happen to get it? And I did not. So I'm gonna have to go back and look at the questions that people submitted. Um, I, I evidently didn't get that. So, um, I apologize. Um, there were probably a bunch of questions in there, so I will respond to each person by email. Uh, there's only like a hundred registrants, so that shouldn't take me too long, <laughs> but it will probably make a good article. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but I will definitely get back to you with the question you sent it, submitted. Um, oh, here we have a question. It's, um, how is the quality plan different uh, from the quality manual in the DMR. So three completely different documents with three completely different purposes. Um, some people call the quality uh, manual their quality plan, but they are not the same. Uh, a lot of FDA people have let companies get away with that. But um, in fact, if you read the ISO standard, which the FDA is not well trained on, uh, they're trained on the QSR instead, which doesn't have a requirement for a quality manual. The quality plan is supposed to be your plan for implementing your quality system or implementing any change to your quality system. You have another clause in the ISO standard. Um, it's in clause 7.1 for product realization planning. And so there's actually two different types of quality plans, one for quality system changes or implementing a brand new quality system. And then you have product realization planning, which is implementing a new product or implementing um, a release of a product in a new country. So you could have a change to a process, implementing a brand new process, implementing a new product, or going into a new country. All three of those are different types of quality plans. The quality manual just says how your quality system meets the requirements of the ISO 1345 standard. And that's a requirement in, I believe, clause 4.2 of the, um, of the ISO standard, but the quality manual in theory could be as short as four pages, um, but usually it's a, a fairly lengthy document that goes clause by clause through the standard and says how you comply. The way we do it, we make we try to streamline a little bit. If there's a required procedure, then we reference the procedure. If there's no required procedure, then we provide a few sentences and, and provide a little bit more detail on how we meet that requirement. 
But if there's a requirement for a procedure, we put all the detail in the procedure instead of also putting it in the manual where you could easily end up with the two diverging over time. Um, so uh, that's the way we handle um, sections that are, have a required procedure. And then the person also asked, what is the difference between that and the DMR? The DMR, it's an acronym the FDA came up with for device master record. The device master record is uh, a collection of all the procedures on and all the specifications for a product. So one is a plan for the quality system. The DMR is a recipe on how to make your product and it's the current recipe. It's also essentially identical to a technical file for Europe or Canada or Australia. So I hope I answered that question well. Um, let me go back here. Uh, the next question was, uh, hi, we're a very small company in design process. We're a total of three people. That represents most of my companies. Uh, we have about 50 clients and they all are companies that are like five to 10 people. Uh, designing a new imaging device for breast cancer, what are the first step we should take towards certification? Um, okay, so the first step towards certification um, is to come up with a plan, and that's what this whole webinar is about. But in terms of actually getting the certification audits done, the stage one, stage two, and getting a, an ISO 1345 certificate, what you need to do is you need to contact uh, the various certification bodies. So you could contact just one or you could contact many of them, but you contact them and ask them for a, an application form and you fill out the form and it's usually many pages long. And then you submit that to them and then they give you a quote. It used to be that the form was fairly short. It was only a couple pages long and you would get a quote in a couple of days. Now it's anywhere from seven to 17 pages and sometimes it takes six months to get a quote back. And that is because all the changes that are going on in Europe. They have radically changed the European requirements. It's created a massive backlog in the European system. And all the notified bodies are required to reapply for their job. Only 15 of the 80 or so that we used to have have been designated so far. And so there is a huge gap between the capacity and the demand. And so that's created a nightmare in the industry and it's leading to a lot of companies that are saying, we can't even quote business right now. So those that give you quotes, be very thankful because there are a lot of that are not quoting and not even telling you that they're not quoting. Um, currently there are 12. Um, I actually am maintaining a list and we're gonna be interviewing each of those notified bodies and registrars for ISO certification. Uh, so those 12 are on our website. If you go to, to medicaldeviceacademy.com and you go to the webinars page. Um, one of the webinars is MDSAP certification interviews. So that's the link you wanna to go to in the page that it'll take you to, it actually gives you a list of the 12 that we recommend. So that would be the, where I would go to get my quote, but they're gonna probably give you dates that are six months out. I have a client in Canada that just filled out their application. Um, I think the, the certification body they picked was in Intertech. So Intertech was recently designated. Um, I think they also talked to SGS. I have another one that's working with LNE GMED, but we work with that list of 12. Those are the 12 that we think are, are really solid uh, certification bodies. There isn't one better than the other for every company. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, but we picked those 12 and this client had just submitted their application, got their quote, and the dates that are being scheduled are in November and December. So if, you're, if you want certification by the end of this year, you're a little bit late. <laughs> You'll be very, very lucky to get a date in 2020 if you apply today. So uh, for those of you that want to do it faster, um, the only possible way to do it faster is if um, you don't need an MD-SAP certificate and you don't need CE marking. If you just want ISO 1345 certification and you don't require an MD-SAP uh, auditing organization, and there are only 15 of those, and you don't need a notified body uh, for CE marking, then you could use um, an organization like Eagle Certification Group. And that's the one that I recommend that is not in that group. Another one that I know of that's fairly popular is PERRY, uh, P-E-R-R-Y. 
I forget what the next part of their name is, but it's uh, Perry, Perry Johnson, I think it is. So Perry Johnson and Eagle Certification Group, those would be two that I know of that are not empty SAP organizations, they're not CE marking. So in general, I don't recommend them to any of my clients because almost all my clients want a regulatory submission in Canada or Europe. But if you're just interested in the US uh, where it's not required to be 1345 or you're gonna be a contract design house or a contract manufacturer, those two organizations would work fine for you. Uh, your company's designing an imaging system for breast cancer. So I'm suspecting that you're probably gonna be interested in um, one of the other types of notified bodies or registrars that handle ANDI, SAP, and C marking in at some point. So you probably wanna think of one of those organizations and be looking a little bit further out in timeline. Uh, Pablo, thank you for the compliment on the presentation. Um, and like I said, any questions you have that you wanna ask confidentially down here in the link here for scheduling an appointment with me. Um, and on our contact us page, medicaldeviceacademy.com, contact us page, it has my contact information, including phone number. Uh, next question, what is a harmonized standard and how is it related to EU regulation? So we have, um, we have standards, they're international standards or ISO standards. Some of them are ANSI, those would be US uh, American National, I forget what the ANSI stands for, but it's an American standards organization. AMI is an American standards organization. Um, IEC is an international one, as is ISO an international one. But harmonized standards, what they have done is they have, somebody has asked, somebody in the European organization has asked for the committee to go back and harmonize the standard. So they go review that standard to the European regulations for medical devices and identify any things that are missing that is a European regulation for medical devices that is not included in the standard. And so when they did this last for 14971, the risk management standard, they actually identified seven uh, deviations, seven different things that if you follow the standard wouldn't meet the requirements of the directive for um, ISO 14971 and the uh, MDD. That's part of the reason why they updated um, and rewrote 14971 for 2019, but they weren't allowed to change the process. So there were certain things that they couldn't change. So there are still some deviations and they have not harmonized the 2019 version. So you still need to be aware of those seven deviations and look at the um, MDR because there are specific risk management requirements in there. So that's an example of how the harmonized standards are different from the ISO international standards. And um, just because it says EN in front of it or says BS for BSI, um, that doesn't mean it's harmonized. It just means it was released by a European standards organization. So those Estonian ones that begin in ES, uh, I think they begin in ES or EV, those those are not harmonized necessarily either. It has to say it's an, a harmonized standard and it will normally have an annex ZA or ZA, BC, ZA, Z, Z, B, and ZC at the beginning indicating how it's harmonized with the regulations or the directives. So if you don't see that in the front, it's not a harmonized standard. Uh, it also used to be in the very back. So it could be in the front or the back depending on the standards organization. Uh, I hope I answered that one. It's it's not an easy question. It's better to cover specific examples of harmonized versus non-harmonized, but I think I covered that well enough. Uh, the next question, is there any database having uh, to fill, fulfill all the requirements of ISO 1345 in medical device management system? Because usually some of the system is not compensating all the needed requirements in this ISO. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand um, this question. So if maybe they, that person could come back to me with like an email, my email is at the bottom of the slides and, and clarify what they're, they are looking for or maybe schedule a, a meeting with me. Uh, my meetings you can schedule from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time because I'm located in Vermont. If that doesn't fit your schedule like you're in, in Asia, um, I usually accommodate Asian clients by meeting with them late at night, like 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. Um, so I'm more than happy to do that. And I have a call with a, a client this week at 6 a.m. So um, I, I do answer those and do uh, accommodate those. 
Um, I'm just not quite sure what that person is asking um, for the requirements there. Um, next one is, can we use ISO 1345 for PPE used in medical? So I think what this person is asking is, is can ISO 1345 be used as a quality system standard for making personal protective equipment, uh, such as masks, um, would be a, a popular example right now under the COVID pandemic. So absolutely, you, um, I have clients that are in Canada and the Health Canada requires you to have uh, a, a have a an MBSAP certificate in order to sell medical devices and get a medical device license. But under the emergency use provisions, they're allowing importers to only have four procedures. So if you're just an importer, they, they're letting you to have just four procedures as an importer, not a full quality system. Uh, one of those procedures is um, a distribution procedure. One of the procedures is a, um, um, a medical, I'm sorry, a mandatory problem reporting procedure. One of them is a recall procedure. And my brain is escaping me here. Oh, the complaint handling. So that's the, that's the fourth one, complaint handling procedure. So those are the four procedures they're requiring. And we actually have all those and they've already been reviewed by Health Canada. So yes, you can use 1345. I, we have a, 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 ma a face mask company that's making surgical face masks. And um, they, are, uh, develop they already were making garments of other types and now they're making face masks and they wanted to implement an ISO 1345 quality system and be FDA compliant and eventually get C marking and Canadian licensing. So yes, 1345 can be used for those, but you're also gonna have standards that apply specifically to the product. So in addition to 1345, they need risk management. They also need, um, there's an ASTM flammability standard. There's some um, synthetic uh, blood uh, testing to in some filtration efficiency testing. So there are different, product specific standards they also need to comply with uh, even biocompatibility testing standards. So you need to keep all those in mind as well as the quality system ones. Um, more questions. Um, this is awesome. Thank you very much everybody for giving me questions. Uh, these, the quality of these trainings goes up dramatically with more questions. Um, Okay, so the next question was, can we use ISO 1345 for PPE C mark certification? For example, an isolation gown. So yes, um, there is a clause in the MDD and I believe it's also in the MDR that says if you have a uh, personal protective equipment that is also a medical device, such as an isolation gown or a face mask, you need to not only create a declaration of conformity for um, the medical device directive, but you also have to include in your declaration of conformity compliance with the PPE directive. So there's a directive for PPE and there's a directive for medical device. So if you're using a face mask or a gown as medical uh, personal protective equipment, it has to comply with both directives. And so the ISO 1345 is harmonized with the um, with the MDD, and now they're they've uh, they haven't yet harmonized it with the MDR, but they will. Um, but yes, 1345 is the standard. But if you, if you look in the MDR, they actually have a section of articles that explains what the minimum procedure requirements are. But generally, what most companies do is they get ISO 1345 certification as part of their CE marking process. And if it's a class one device, uh, their self-declaration, usually the authorized representatives in the, in the country you're uh, registering with uh, or the member state you're registering with will expect you to provide a copy of your ISO 1345 certificate. So yes, that is what you would use, but it's not the only thing you use. You have a declaration of conformity also indicating what standards you comply with. Uh, the next question. Um, we are a small medical device manufacturer, about 10 people for an FDA class two standard industry tool. We are retroactively working on the design documentation, design development file, and we have had troubles with this because the device is so instrumental and basic that there are no design documents outside of outdated medical textbooks. Clinical trials are expensive, so we're wondering what we could possibly do for ISO certification as well as C marking in the future. 
Um, I'd have to know a little bit more about this, I think. Um, it says here, I, I know we can exclude design and development, but I'm not sure if that's the best method because someone has to be responsible for the design. So if this is a class one product, um, so the, the FDA and Europe and Canada, they all have classifications of devices. Class one is general, the lowest classification of risk and class three is the highest, except in Canada where they have a class four. Europe has a class 2A and a class 2B. In the US, we have class one, two, and three. Class three devices, all but I think four product codes now for class three are PMA devices. So they require clinical investigation and are very expensive and, and have much more rigorous regulations. Class two is the big fat middle, 80% of the medical devices out there. And most of those have some sort of special controls. And these class two medical devices are generally considered moderate risk. And most of them require 510K, but not all, there are exceptions. The class one devices require general controls. Most of them don't require 510K, but there are a few exceptions of class ones that do. Um, but these class one devices, all except for six product families, they do not require design controls. So if your device is a class one, and it is not one of those six. Um, one of them would be like protective restraints. Another one is surgical gloves, I believe. Um, so if you're one of those six products, then you have to have design controls for a class one. If you're not, and this sounds like it might not be one of those, um, if it's a class one, then you're not required to have design controls. So then you don't need design and you can exclude design from your ISO certification and nobody is responsible for the design. Um, because it's a simple device. But if it's a class two device or it's a class, one of the six that require design controls, then you'll have to have um, design controls. And I'd be happy to help you. Um, I've worked on a lot of really simple devices as well as very high risk implants. So we might be able to help you brainstorm which standards might be applicable and what kind of verification validation testing you might wanna be doing. Um, but I, I've worked on hundreds of different projects. So um, give me an email and let me see if I can help. A um, Couple of thank yous, you're very welcome. And thank you for the questions, they, those are really helpful. Um, how does ISO 1345 quality plan differ from the FDA quality plan? So the FDA doesn't say what a quality plan is. And so that's why a lot of people have provided a, a manual to the FDA and said, this is our quality plan. And the FDA said, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is nothing in um, the Q, I'm sorry, the QSIP manual, the inspection manual that tells you this is what an inspector should be looking for for a quality plan. Um, so the, the concept of a quality plan as it is indicated in the ISO standard, it doesn't match up very well with what is in the FDA quality planning. And the FDA doesn't really have a, a very clear definitive um, or prescriptive, prescriptive requirement for what FDA quality planning is. The FDA expects you to plan things. Yes, absolutely. And they expect you to have design plans and risk management plans, and they expect you to have um, plans for launching your product and plans for implementing your quality system. But uh, they don't expect you to have a document that says quality plan on the top of it and tells you how you're gonna implement your quality system to 1345. That's an expectation of ISO 1345 in the quality planning clause. So those are very different. There's also product realization planning. The FDA is really expects you to have a quality system plan for product realization whenever you're gonna launch a new product. That they expect in it, their focus is design controls and then design transfer. So if you're thinking about product realization planning, they expect you to have a risk management process. They expect you to have uh, design transfer, they expect you to do design planning. That's how they're gonna focus on design plans or, or quality plans at the FDA. Um, it, and it's just different. It's different terminology and they mean something different in ISO 1345, even though they both have the same words, quality plan. Um, somebody um, had a question after the first question that they sent you, I have no, okay. They, they're not sure how to make a quality plan. Uh, for example, in an Excel spreadsheet. So um, I actually uh, provide you with a download from our website of uh, an example of a quality plan. 
that we have articles on our website for how to create quality plans. Um, and really, there isn't a, this is how you shall write a quality plan. It's a plan. It, it's here are the various steps that need to be done. Here's, here's who's supposed to do them. And here's the dates they're supposed to be done. And ideally, you would have objective criteria for how you're going to say, we succeeded. So what tasks, who's going to do them, when they're supposed to be done by, and how do you know it was done well? The, those are the basic concepts behind um, a plan, a quality plan. And uh, another term that's used or acronym that's used is PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. It's the Deming cycle. You create a plan. You perform the plan as you intended. You check it. So you, you review it against the objective criteria that you said this would be a success if we did it this way. And then any shortfalls, any any place where you weren't compliant with what your expectations were, those are opportunities for corrective actions or preventive actions. So don't worry too much about, am I doing this right? It doesn't have to be in an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be in a Word document. Um, and it doesn't have a standardized format. This is, shall you, you shall do it this way. That doesn't exist. Um, what you need to help with somebody that asks an auditor that comes says, do you have a quality plan? It helps if you put the words quality plan on the top of the document. Uh, sometimes labeling convinces somebody this is what it is. Um, but it, just like a DMR, there's not, this is what shall be in a DMR. A lot of people believe there is, but it's very vague in what should be in a DMR. So I've had FDA inspectors come in and say, can I see your DMR? And the person looked a little scared. So when they left the room, I followed them and said, do you have a DMR? Do you know what one is? They didn't. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Take a manila folder. In that, on that manila folder, put in very clear, like a, with a label maker, put um, this is the device master record and put the product number. So the, the file is labeled DMR. Labeling it helps a lot. <laughs> and then, um, just like with quality plans, label it quality plan. So that DMR is labeled. It's a middle of a folder. In that, put your bill of materials, put your IFU or in labeling for the product, put your drawings for the product, and put your inspection procedure for that product or inspection uh, work instruction. Put those four things in there, and that could be a DMR. I'd like to see more than that. But you're probably not going to get a 43 if you have something that's labeled DMR and has those four things in it. Most inspectors wouldn't give you a 43. They might want more, but if you had that, that would probably suffice. Um, for a more complex product, that probably wouldn't, but a, a very simple product, that probably would work. For a quality plan, show them something that says quality plan, has the steps that you're going to execute, the dates you're going to do it, who's going to be responsible for each task, and how you're going to determine whether it was successful or not, such as we're going to do an internal audit. So that's how I would develop your own quality plan. Make it simple. Don't, don't, don't boil the ocean here. Uh, next question. No, they, they said it's very clear, and they said uh, a Gantt chart-like plan will work okay. Yes, it will. Um, you can come up with Gantt charts. If you like Gantt charts, that's great. Uh, a lot of people are intimidated by Microsoft Project, but um, those people that have done project management before and very large development projects or installation projects, the, it's a great tool. So if you know how to use it, definitely use it. Uh, just make sure it's legible. Um, so you, you may find you need to break it up into smaller tasks uh, in order to make it legible and have different pages of it. But grant, Gantt charts work great. So do uh, tables. So do spreadsheets. So all of those are options. Uh, next question. Oh, we had somebody that started one and didn't finish it. Okay. So um, I think that's it for the questions for today. I don't see any more showing up. Um, and we had a, we still have 13 people here. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating. I'm going to uh, stop the recording because we're already now at, uh, um, let's see, what time is it? It's almost 10 o'clock. So we've been going on uh, here for about an hour and a half, which is what we had planned on. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, provide a link by email to where you can find it on YouTube. But if you go to Medical Device Academy's YouTube channel, you'll find it there uh, later on today. So thank you very much. And uh, you will get the slide deck. Uh, James, I will remember to email you the slide deck. And anybody that registered for this, 
on, on our website should get it automatically. Uh, they should have gotten it actually this morning. So um, if you register after this um, and, you're, and you're still looking for it, please let me know. Just shoot me an email. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.